uh, Connecticut Army National Guard, rank was Staff Sergeant E6, and served in Afghanistan. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I enlisted. And where were you living at the time when you enlisted? Uh, I was living at home. Why did you join? Well, I, I really didn't have a clear path of where I wanted, where I wanted to travel. I, mean, I knew where I wanted to be, I just didn't know how I was going to get there. So I was going through some changes in my life and I figured um, the military is probably best for me. It'll give me a new beginning, put some discipline in me, which it did. Why did you pick, you pick that particular branch of service? Um, actually, my first branch of service was the Marines. And I was actually um, on my way to take the ASVAB for the Marines, and uh, one of my buddy calls me up in my peer leadership group, and he uh, asked me if I wanted to go to school. And obviously, I, I did want to go to school. He knew that. And he asked me, what if I wanted to go to school and still enjoy the military life? I never knew about the National Guard and Reserves. And uh, he filled me in, and I went into one of the training weekends with him because he told me to play laser tag out in the woods. And I thought, okay, find a civilian laser tag that I see on TV. Went with him, and um, I, I enjoyed it, and I liked the idea of going to school, being able to go to school, and being called upon to help your community, and being activated by the president when need be. So it was the best of both worlds. So I kind of blew off the Marine recruiter and uh, joined the Connecticut. National Guard instead. Uh, do you recall the first days of service that you had? First days? Mm -hmm. Well, I enlisted on the 15th. I was scheduled to ship out on, I actually shipped out August 20th, 1998. And um, first day of actual service was cutting weeds in one of the uh, armories. Because I, I wasn't able to show up for one of the training weekends. I really had to take the SATs or something like that, but one well, of the first few days it was actually, uh, yeah, cutting grass with the Army. But um, you're asking the first few days of service in boot camp, that was August 20th. And you, don't, you, don't, you don't forget when you went into boot camp. The reason why I didn't forget was because that was the day President Clinton ordered the bombing of uh, terrorist training camps in Afghanistan. It was a couple weeks, I think it was a couple weeks after they bombed the, the Kenya, the embassy, our embassy in Kenya. I was, it was uh, bombed. So, President Clinton ordered airstrikes on that day. The day I was going to boot camp. And, uh, that was just almost like a revelation. Do you remember any of the instructors that you had or what it was like the first days of boot camp? I remember two of my three, three drill instructors, but I remember two that sticks with me. One, 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 one especially, because one was going to be real significant in my military career. Um, Drill Sergeant Callahan and uh, Drill Sergeant Newman. Drill Sergeant Newman being the one I was speaking of. Because little did I know I was going to run into him, I want to say, three more times in my military career. And I was kind of, I was kind of weird. But he was a, uh, he's a real, t real young, disgruntled, tough guy. You know? Yeah, how do you spell his name? Noonan, N O O N A N. Drill Sergeant Newman. Out of Boston. It's just a funny guy. How did you get through it? How did you get through it? Um, it was it was tough because I was seeing guys twice my size. Not, not, I mean guys who were like hometown football heroes or wrestling captain of the wrestling team. I, guys like that would drop it. And I was I went down to boot camp at 111 pounds, just barely made it. I when I went to Memphis, I was, I was 109. And they told me I had to put on a couple of pounds if I was even they were gonna ship me off. But um, I was going through some tough times high school. I had a high school sweetheart who, you know, broke my heart. And uh, you know, for the first month of boot camp, it was hard because that was that was all I was thinking about. I was feeling sorry for myself and just crying myself to bed every every night, wondering what what did I get myself what did I get myself into? You know, I see guys dropping left and right. Guys who were twice my size. Guy who in high school I thought was, you know going to be the, 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 the star of the town, the, the guys with the star of school who I didn't think would give up or always there to, to fight the whole way through. And I just woke up one day and I just told myself I, I couldn't live like this anymore. I had to, if I was going to do it, I had to do it for myself. I, I mean, I joined. One of the reasons why I joined was to reinvent myself, recreate myself. 
make myself stronger. And um, just the fact of seeing, you know, that I was 40, 50 pounds lighter than these guys who look a lot more physically fit than I was, just to see them fall and see myself still lasting that long, I had the Napoleon complex just came, came out right there. And um, I got through it because I, you know, I told myself, this, this, I, I, have, I have to be this, this new person. I had to reinvent myself. I had to, had to make it. I had to show these guys that look, look, look. You got a guy who's 50, 60 pounds lighter than you. You guys, you know, they look. Some of them looked at me and didn't think I was going to make it at all, and they had to prove them wrong. In fact, I wanted to prove a lot of people wrong. Can you tell me? Uh, you were in service, um, specifically in Iraq. Afghanistan. Afghanistan. I'm sorry. And um, can you tell me where you went? Oh. Roughly where you went. I think the, cent the central <coughs> insertion point in Afghanistan was actually Bagram Air Base. It's in north northern Afghanistan. It's over here. They got it. Bamla. No, it's not Bamla. Can't seem to find it on here, but it's right around this area right here. Okay. Back in, back in Afghanistan, that's the uh, air base. Okay. That's the um, actually the, the base when the first Americans who went in after 9/11 fought for that base. The CIA went in. They had help with the Northern Alliance and the uh, special forces of the 555. Five. Those guys actually went in and uh, fought in that, that air base. So that was kind of like a historical spot for us to be in. Uh, that's the main insertion point. That's where everyone who comes into Afghanistan go when they're flying to Bagram, Bagram Air Base. From there, we stayed there for about three days. A lot of a lot of other guys, a lot of them stayed longer, but we had to get out of there as soon as we can. Um, stayed there, flew across the Hindu Kush into a province called Lagman Province. That's one of the uh, moderate, I want to say major or minor cities, but it, it's a pretty decent sized area. I guess they consider considered a city, but uh, it's right. Yeah, Kabul right there, mm -hmm. Jalalabad right, Jalalabad to the uh, to the east. Drive further up north and Lagman, right about in this area. I don't know why they wouldn't have it. But right, mm -hmm. right there, right north northeast Afghanistan. Do you uh, remember arriving and what it was like? I do. I actually remember arriving. Uh, when we first arrived in country, it was it was just uh, it was just Pog, Pog country, and Pog is a uh, an acronym for personnel other than grunts. Anyone who's not infantry is Pog. And uh, we arrived there, and I thought it was, it was surreal to me because I've never seen any scenery like it. We landed in a real extremely flat airfield uh, with, I want to say, desert around it. And then out in the distance, probably about a good 10, maybe more miles out, are the mountains all around us. And there's nothing i ever seen because it, it was just mountains. And you, it's, you could clearly see the clouds touching the mountains, passing through the mountains. And I thought, wow, this is actually looks like a really beautiful country. But uh, we arrived in, we were greeted by my Air Force Commander. It's a long story, but we did by my uh, Task Force Commander. And uh, looking around, I'm like, this is supposed to be a bat this cannot be a battlefield. But, you know, it was an airfield with soldiers, and everyone looks, the place looks pretty secure and safe. And it's nothing from what I've read or seen, you know. And at the same time, thinking about the time when the CIA agents and the uh, Special Forces guys were fighting the Taliban, section to section of that airbase. It's just to gain ground, just so the uh, Rangers can jump in later on, and serve as an insertion point for all military military personnel in the early days of the war, even now. But I just thought Dude, these people. How many, how many of these soldiers on this base actually seen combat? Been in combat? I know I haven't yet. But they had a they actually had a road called Disney, and this place had everything. They had huge chow halls. But I want to say five, four or five chow halls. They were huge. They could eat just about anything they want to eat. You know, Friday, Friday and Saturday, there's lobsters and, and, and steak night for them. And they had a Dairy Queen. 
They had a Burger King. They had two big PXs. Those were post exchange. It was, it was like a mini mall in some of these. It actually, one of that place actually looked like a mini mall. And I'm thinking to myself, it, it kind of reminds me of Eagle Base back in Bosnia, but four times the size of that. And everyone was living a happy life, you know. Officers walking around what we call Salud Alley, the main road, which is like an, a mile and a half long. And you had to salute every officer that came down that alley. That's one place I told my guys to and try to avoid. Walk around there if you have to. You know, the Air Force had their section. The Special Forces had their little compound. The Afghan Army had their small little compound down there. It was a huge base. Huge base. It was a little big base. And um, I'm, I'm, and I'm thinking, I hope the rest of the can't say it's not like this because you know this is we're, we're infantry soldiers. My men were going to be on this base. There's no way they're going to keep in shape, even though they had like state of the art weight uh, training facilities, weightlifting facilities. But it was it was like a regular army base in America. You had you had everything. You had everything. <laughs> but. We wanted to get out there as soon as possible because we I couldn't stand being around that infantry personnel for too long. The nitpicking, the sweat, sweating for small stuff, the you know, I couldn't stand being around it. So the squad leader platoon, platoon sergeant, we got we didn't have a platoon leader yet. Our lieutenant hasn't arrived yet, he hasn't been assigned to us yet. So platoon sergeant was the acting platoon leader, which is the lieutenant, acting lieutenant. And uh, we got together and we're like, we need to get out of here as soon as possible. Get us through every class that we need to get through, because there's still a couple of classes we had to take in Afghanistan, familiarization classes, like IED classes, and fire explosive device classes, uh, and custom classes, so <clears throat> we uh, went out on our own chain, just reached right through those classes, we got out faster than a lot of the other platoons. We had, we had 13 platoons, I believe, 12 or 13 platoons out of the entire battalion that was in Afghanistan. We were, we got there in three days, we got out, we, we actually, my platoon sergeant actually walked around looking for pilots to fly us out of there. It, was, it should have been the operations officer's job. We actually found a flight, and that was an all-day event right there. We, had, we got a, you know, three days later, three days after being in Afghanistan, we got around the airfield to get on the Chinooks, and it was an all-day event. We got there at six o'clock in the morning. Guys haven't eaten breakfast yet. We got all our stuff, all our gear packed, got there. Uh, the Chinook guys had it. Chinook, first off, the pilots didn't even know who they were picking up. Problem number one. And we couldn't find them. And we found them about an hour later. They didn't know who they were picking up. And when they finally, you know, exchanged information, they did the inspection. And it looks like we were about to take off. We were ready to load our gear. And then the uh, Chinook had some mechanical problems with it. So they had to stay down. So. Now it's about 10 o'clock in the morning. We still haven't flown out yet. So we walked around looking for another, looking for a few other pilots. Found a couple others. They were in Blackhawks, you know, which is a smaller bird. And those guys were happy to take us out, take us to Laden Province. Now, mind you, no one heard about Laden Province. No one in the time heard about Laden Province. They heard about Jalalabad. They heard about Terran Cow, Lashkar Gah, you know, those so-called bad places to be. But no one ever heard about Laden Province. And we had it. We were, the, we were the detachment one platoon that was put together last minute out of guys from different job skills. We were, we were basically the, uh, the Kibasa platoon, you know, the leftovers just put together. And, what was uh, your particular job? I was an infantry squad leader. Okay. But um, we got we got to Lagman province. We flew there, flew through the path. I'm, I'm, I get to see Afghanistan from there, and I thought, wow, this is beautiful. At the same time, it also sucked. We, uh, just got shot at and crashed right now because that's a long drop. Hit the side of a mountain and roll all the way down to the bottom of the reef. But we flew out. Um, we flew out and that was the first taste of actually getting shot at. What happened was the, there was a guy in the mountain taking pop shots at us. And we, the way we were flying, we weren't flying above the mountaintops. We were flying on par with the side of the mountains, going through the uh, path. <laughs> the guy took a shot and the first thing that came to my mind was, where's my video camera? I gotta get this because I felt I felt I felt fairly safe in Black Hawk. You know the door gunners were already on the guys. Door guns guys have been there for a while. Door gunners to shoot him back. I don't know if he he had the target or not. Cause by the time I reached for my camera, we were already passed. Pat. 
pass point. We got to, uh, it was about a 45 minute flight to, uh, log, to Lagan Province to our FOB, which is Fort Observation Place. And it was known as FOB Methyl Lab. That was the city we were in, it was Methyl Lab. And uh, we got there, and the pilots were doing circles around the base, and they were really, the pilots were really showing off. And uh, we were doing circles around the base, and it was going fast around the little FOB. It was a small little FOB. Compared to the back room, this thing was small. I, I probably, I, it's probably about the size of the library. That's how small it was. The ground, the actual, the campground put together would include the library and the next building over. And uh, it was cut in half. One side for the Afghan National Army, one side for us. And we hit ground, and the first thing, I was, I was the highest ranking ninth mission officer to touch ground, the relief, to touch ground. I literally had not had one foot on the ground yet. I went foot on the ground, one foot on the bird, and their highest non commissioned officer from their group that was that's been there that we're leaving comes up to me and tells me, Many of you guys are at the tower right now. <laughs> Replacements. And I'm thinking, this is not the correct way to relief. You get relief in place. My guys have not eaten yet. They just they woke up at four in the morning. We haven't seen we haven't taken a walk through the area yet and he wants me to he wants me to take my guys and relieve his guys. And I'm thinking, what a bunch of crap. Who 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 are these guys? You know? And I told him that, I told him that's a negative. I'm not believing anything. I'm not doing anything until I take a full recon of this place and know where all the positions are, all the fighting positions are, and all the bunkers are. To which he reluctantly agreed to. You know, I mean, these guys we replaced were just a bunch of yahoos. A bunch of, the epitome of the national, they were the epitome of the, the old National Guard. And what everyone viewed National Guard as these, this is what these guys were, weekend warriors who were just not professional. I'm not going to give you names, but I will tell you that they were part of the uh, of Texas National Guard. I won't say which particular units, but I was just thinking, how unprofessional is this guy? Just come here and tell me. <laughs> still got my bag, my bag on me. My guys are still in the bird. I'm the first one to get off, and he comes up and tells me he needs relief right now. I don't think so. No way. Needless to say, you know, my guys had about an hour to get their stuff down. What we didn't know was. This, this guy actually pulled some of these guys off the tower. That was not, it was, it was not known to me. They had, we had five towers they had a guard. Pull these guys off, pull these guys off the tower. So, basically for that hour, a couple of towers were unmanned. And I'm thinking, I, 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 was, I, was, I was, by that time I was red. By, by the time I found out I was red, but this guy couldn't, there was nowhere to be found. You know, and I was, I was angry because I'm like, this is probably one of the times, best times for them to hit us is when the Taliban knows this is where we're switching, we're, we're switching spots. It's the left right scene. You know, our security is not up to par when it should be at its maximum level. It wasn't. It was at, it hasn't even reached the bare, it, had, it was below bare minimum. We had only three, three guard towers that was manned. Two of them weren't because this guy decides to pull off his guys and put them on the bird right away. That's what happened. As soon as my guys got off, he put his guys on the helicopter to take off. So I was, I was angry, but um, put my guys on the bird, and that's when the rest of the iteration showed up. The uh, rest of the tune showed up. And uh, I gave them the rundown, and for the first three weeks, for the first three weeks, we were doing 12 hours of guard duty. 12 hours of guard duty and uh, 12 hours of mission. So my guys, for the first three weeks, each squad, we had, we had, we had four squads, which was cut down to three stacked up squads, infantry squads, because we didn't have enough staff sergeants. We had three, three staff sergeants. And um, we weren't going to give a regular sergeant his own squad, give, given the condition of uh, the, you know, given, given our condition right there. So we, we cut down the fourth squad, we placed them with the, you know, dispersed them throughout the other squads. So we had three, three stack squads. Each squad, lead, each squad lead, leader had about 15 guys. And um, for the first two weeks, we were running, we were running missions. Uh, my, first, my first mission outside the wire, I was the first squad. I was the first squad to go out. My squad was the first squad to go out inside the wire. We were doing left seat, right seat with a small contingent of Marines who were there. Uh, I think it was one, three, and two, three Marines. Contingent of one, three, and two, three, two, three Marines who were left at the five. Fort Observation Base. So we were doing our left seat, right seat with them. And uh, my first actual patrol out there, we actually got engaged. First ever. And that was probably, I wouldn't say that was, that was day five in Afghanistan, I want to say. In actual, day five in Afghanistan, day two inside the five. Observation base. And uh, 
So we took mortar rounds, and it was just uh, turning fire. That's that right there just told me, okay, you know, first patrol, first first patrol, we got engaged. This is this is this. That right there is second tempo for the remainder of the time we were in Afghanistan, and which and it was it was proven that you know that what I said was not wrong. It did set the tempo, and the next 365 days were going to be just not good. How do you feel when you're under fire? Well, I just it, uh, you know, being in the helicopter, I, I felt okay. You know, but then being on the ground, I was inside Humvee, and uh, we took mortar rounds, and it kind of, it kind of, it felt like okay, this this is kind of bad. At first, I was I was scared. Anyone who tells you they're not scared is lying to you. You know, anyone who tells you that they have no fear is lying to you. You you are fearful. You are scared. It's how you deal with it that makes a difference. Mm -hmm. um, I was inside an apartment Humvee, we were checking what around. Uh, I didn't know where it was coming from. My gunner didn't first didn't know where it was coming from. Then when he finally did, he, he shot back. And then the Marine, the, guys, the Marine guys were in the front seat and I was in the back seat. The Marines in the front, you know, I, I, I outranked them, but I wasn't going to pull any rank on them uh, because they, they knew what they were doing. You know. I asked them what was going on. They're like, oh, there's some guys this morning. There's nonchalantly. So this tells me, okay, this is normal, these guys from over here. So it kind of brought me down a level. But I wasn't too fearful. I wasn't too fearful after you know, their short like, don't worry about it, sorry. It's, these guys, they do it all the time. It wasn't the same. They never hit. They haven't hit any of us yet. That made me feel better. And uh, I wasn't able to engage. I was, because we our orders was just keep on moving. Don't even, don't even just bother engage. But we were still taking rounds. We were still taking water rounds. It was coming in. Uh, we got out of there. It's the first time I've ever been on the receiving end of a water round. I mean, I've, I've called for fire, which is, you know, I've, I've been a port observer during a training exercise where I called water rounds out. And I see it landing, and I'm thinking to myself, it must suck to be the enemy getting hit by water rounds. Well, it sucked to be the guy getting water rounds come in on you. I can tell you from first hand experience, seeing it come in. Um, that, was, that was our first engagement. Can you give me a couple memorable experiences that you had? Um, well, let's fast forward two months. I wouldn't say, yeah, we'll, we'll fast forward about two months, three months in. Same area, you know. Um, we, our platoon leader hasn't shown up yet. Our platoon sergeant was too busy taking care of, uh, taking care of logistical, logistical support inside the base. So what happened was all the staff sergeants were left in charge of the were made patrol leaders, and uh, our to better understand what, what I was doing, you have to know what what our what we what we were comprised of, what our mission was. We were actually. Should I continue? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> we were actually <laughs> a, our battalion was broken up into separate platoons, and we were cut down to. Um, Security Force Platoon for PRT. PRT was a new concept for the uh, military. It was a new way to win hearts and minds. And PRT stands for Provincial Reconstruction Teams. It consisted of civil affairs officers, engineers, um, State Department officials, um, basically non-combat professions. That was there to help build the infrastructure, Afghanistan's infrastructure. And they were sent off to regions where the local government can't can you know, have no influence where, where their government has really has no influence and they were sent there to reach out to villages and security force platoon was to protect these guys, get them where they need to be, uh, make sure they're safe, then bring them back. And that's what that's what we were doing. So you had lieutenant colonels, majors, captains that you had to escort and um, even though the colonel was the colonel or the captain or the major, whoever, might be the highest ranking guy in the mission, but you are the highest ranking Security. You you were the you were the security force commander, so between on, on, on you, what you said went as far as security goes. If it was not safe, you had to tell that highest ranking officer, hey sir, you had to stay in the vehicle, or we we need we need to, we need to get back now because this is not safe. Mm -hmm. It was your job to fight, and their job their job to deliver aid, their job to speak to the village elders, their job to. You know, get people, get contractors to build bridges and roads. And it was our job to, it was our job to fight and protect. And um, one of the most memorable moments was coming back 
from Dollar Shah. Dollar Shah was the hot spot. It was the Taliban stronghold. We knew it. It was the foot of the Hindu Kush. Taliban, Taliban stronghold. So coming back from Dollar Shah. And uh, there, that was one of the missions where the colonel was on it. And they brought the... Uh, it, was, it was the first time that the Logman governor drove up there. So it was a big deal. We got up there, there was a whole party waiting for us. Well, a whole welcoming party, not, not in a bad way, but they had the Afghan National Army and Afghan National Police who have grave distrust of each other, had to work with each other to secure the spot before we showed up. It was about a, an hour and a half drive, two hour drive. And it's only one road, a long mountain path. And uh, on our way back, I don't know what was going on. It was a long, huge, huge convoy made up of a and AMP, and military. Long convoy, and uh, NDS, which is the national, national, uh, whatever. It's the, it's the Afghan's equivalent of the FBI. Mm -hmm. the, the, the National Directorate Service, or something like that. I forgot what it stood for, but it was a long convoy. And um, ironically, well, I was, I was at the end of the convoy. I was near the end. I was the last military vehicle, and behind me was an AMP vehicle, the Afghan National Police vehicle, and behind him was uh, a national, an Afghan National Army truck. In front of me was a, nas a national, an Afghan National Army truck, and then in front of that national, Afghan National Army truck was the embedded training team, which is another military force who who was embedded with the Afghan National Army to train them and take them take them out of mission. And um, ironically, we ended up. I ended up in an area where I took the motor with my with my first patrol back. No, my first patrol back took one around. And, um, but they, like I said, I was at the end of the convoy. It was a long convoy. The front of the convoy started taking water rounds. But we were already, we were already behind. We, we, we could see, we could see the, the hill getting hit because we were going up a hill. And the beginning of the convoy starts taking water rounds. Inaccurate, but a lot. Mm. And uh, I'm telling my gunner, I said, hey, do you see him? Do you see him? And my guys are looking, looking. No, we can't see where it's coming from. And we're getting closer. Motor rounds still come in, we're getting closer in. Luckily, the guy behind me was an Air Force mechanic. I took him along with me because he hasn't been outside the wire and he wanted to go so bad. So I took him with me and he sat behind me, I kept him behind me. And he was the only guy to see where it came from. He could see the streamers. When the motor rounds are sent out, you know, old, old motor tubes, you can see the streamers, the smoke tubes. And he sees it. My gunner still hasn't seen it. And um, nobody sees it. And I think the last order on on the mic from the platoon sergeant was stay inside your vehicle. My guy doesn't see it. But I see it, and uh, you know I had one. I had a, I had a full mag. I had one magazine that was all tracers, thirty rounds of tracers, and tracers are ammunition that lights up when you shoot it because the tip it has a phosphorus tip, so it lights up like lasers when you shoot it. And um, and so I roll. I rolled. I rolled the windows down. Roll the windows down, and I shot my entire tracers until my gunner could see where see where it was. And right when I shot the tracers, the, of course the enemy saw where it came from. Also, then we realized there was another mortar precision. So there was two mortar precisions. That's why they were able to fire it so fast, which is also why it was also not too accurate. But it was close. So we saw two mortar precisions, and uh, my gunner engaged. And uh, then for some for some reason, the convoy decides to stop. But it. It chose. It couldn't choose a better time to stop, because when they stopped, it left my truck, my the the three A and A A and P truck on the mountaintop, where they where they where they were the concentrating their fire on. And I'm thinking, wow, this is unbelievable. I was I was cussing every word that was out of the American dictionary, out of the Webster dictionary, and using every bad word out of the dictionary. I'm getting on the radio like you know, screaming, yeah, what? What's going on? We, um, we're, we're exposed up in the mountains. They're, of course, they were safe because they were already down, and they were already down in the in the uh, sort of I want to say populated area in a village area where there was trees, and a nice little river, and they were safe. But I wasn't, and I'm still taking water rounds. And uh, I look at the guys in the A and A truck in front of me, and they're they're looking at me like, "What do we do? What do we do? We can get hit in a moment." And my guys, are, my guys, are like, "Start moving. We, we, you need to tell these guys to start moving." And uh, I'm getting on the radio. I'm like, you know. What the hell's going on? You need to move now. And uh, we weren't moving, and the motor was still coming in. And I just got to a point where, you know what? We're going to die anyways. So, F it. So, I kicked the door open, and I was the first one out of the vehicle. I kicked the door open, and my guys decided to follow me. The only one who stayed in the truck was uh, the gunner. 
my guys got out of the vehicle, and uh, so we were exposed. You know, it was, it was mano y mano. They can see us, we can see them. We were exposed. Uh, we started returning fire. I was like, everyone, expend all your ammo, right? Expend your ammo right now. I want you to light, light them up. So we were engaging two mortar positions, and the mortar rounds were just coming in, left and right, left and right. So the A&A sees it, and, and you know, they're like, wow, these, these, guys are, these guys are no joke. So they get out of their trucks. The other guys get out of their truck, their truck, and now we got a whole firing line set up. You know, we got probably about, I would want to say, a good 20 guys, 20, 25 guys in the firing line. And it was just spraying away. And it was more rounds coming in, machine gun fire coming at us, and we were just spraying away. My trucks, my, my gunner on the trucks was shooting away. Uh, we were able to silence one more, one more decision. We, we got one more decision. And uh, the guys who were safe in the, in the nice little wooded area now, see, see, they, 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 could, they could see the tracer run going at it. They could see what we were shooting at, so they started returning fire. So now we have maximum firepower on both positions. And uh, one mortar round landed probably about, I want to say, 30 yards behind me on the other side of the truck. And that's when my medic looks at me with Sergeant Rowe, and uh, they get they get kind of close. And I'm like, Doc, just keep on effing shooting. Keep on effing shooting. Because we're not moving anytime soon. And um, the thing they got, and about 30 seconds later, a mortar round lands about 15 yards to my right, right behind the. Afghan National Police truck, and I can see guys flying, and uh, then my medic looks at me, he goes, Sergeant Rowan, I think we need to get inside the vehicle, and I just looked at him, like, <laughs> it, was, it was a funny moment, because I looked at him, and my guys, my guys just assumed, and they're looking at me, and I'm like, yeah, I think you're right, let's go, it's just, just like that, I think you're right, no screaming, no yelling, it's just, I think you're right, let's go, <laughs> and uh, I get in the vehicle, and I, I uh, called it up, you know, I, I called it up, and I said, hey, Raider 7, we just took a motor on in our, in our convoy. Uh, I think the AP truck is hit. And uh, he goes, okay, we're moving. Sure enough, we start moving. Uh, we took one final motor round. And that motor round landed probably about five meters away from the road, where, right where my truck was. My gunner saw it, he's like, so oh, it's a good thing we got out of there. Because <laughs> that motor round just landed right where we were. And uh, you know, the, guys, the, guys, the guys in the truck behind me weren't hurt. What happened was the motor round hit. But it hit so close that the guys decided to jump for, after the one around here. I don't, I don't know why. Yeah, guys are funny like that. But decided to jump, and that's what I saw when I said bodies were flying. It was a couple of Afghan guys were jumping all the way. And um, that was a memorable moment because I thought it was, it was funny. It was, it was funny. It was just a adrenaline rush at the same time because it was just, you know, it's. It, it was like it was. It kind of reminded me of the old Revolutionary War days where it was firing line to firing line. That's what it was. It was firing line to firing line, and just how it ended was was funny. You came out of it. Okay. Did you uh, get any awards or medals or citations while you were in service? Um, I think the biggest award I got was the Army Commendation Medal, the ARCOM, and uh, of course everyone everyone in my platoon got the Combat Infantry Man Badge, which means you've been in combat. Uh, a couple other squad leaders got the Army Commendation with Valor, and. Uh, like that kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. I mean, it was, it it, it was it was an internal political conflict in the platoon. You know, platoon sergeant and platoon leader didn't really like me too much, and it, I, I was I was I was bitter about it. But I was more bitter because my men deserved more. My men deserved more than what they got. And that's that's what I was, I was bitter about. I mean, minus the fact that the other staff sergeants got the ARCOM the ARCOM with valor, and you know. My, the mind's whole entire squad was just saying to ourselves, how could, how could they get the Arkham and Valor and their guys get the bigger woods when we've been in more firefights and we're the ones who saved their ass a lot of times. Just, sadly, that, sadly that, was, that was the truth, was that most of the time we, we were tasked with being the quick reaction force. And when these squads got hit, it was my squad who went out there and uh, pulled them back, got them back safely, or reinforced them. So that kind of left a, a bitter taste in, in our mouths, was, you know, these guys leaders got that higher higher award, but it you know it, it was it was more I was I was more bitter for my men than it was for myself. I didn't I didn't care. Awards mean absolutely nothing to me. Absolutely nothing. I'd rather have guys coming back home safe in one piece than have a award. I mean, if as 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 long as, as long as guys come home and they come home safe and fine, you can keep your award. I'll I'll I'll, I'll trade any award for for an American life. American soldiers' lives, Marines or Airmen or Seamen. 
let's move forward a little bit towards um, what you did and how you stayed in touch and, and your daily life there. What, um, how did you, did you stay in touch with your family? I did. We had a, our small little fob had a little uh, M MWR center. It was Morale Welfare Recreation Center. And we had uh, computers and DSN phones set up. As long as, you have a, as long as you have a calling card. Not a civilian calling card, but the kind of MWR gives you. And um, we were able to get online whenever you have free time. Get, on get online, send emails, or make a phone call. Um, I, I, was, I, was, I was able to call home a lot and keep in touch a lot. You know, I mean, especially after, after, the, after, after once we had the second month, we, we had our, you know, we, we had a set schedule. Every, you know, we had three squads, each squad knew what they were doing. One, for one week, a squad would be on missions, one squad would be on quick, re one squad would be the quick reaction force, and one squad would be on guard duty. And you rotate, rotate. So which squad, whatever squad was on, which, whichever squad was doing the quick reaction force, or on guard duty, they had more time than the squad who were on missions to use the phone and uh, go on the internet. But it was, um, mail, mail sucked for the first few months. You know, you get mail like once every three weeks. But the guys still able to call home or send emails home. So that was not a problem. Um, you mentioned uh, that you, the big base had big mess halls. What type of food did you have? The big one or our, our, our smaller ones? You are smaller ones. <laughs> smaller for, for observation base, prison food. <laughs> we had prison food. No, no, but uh, uh, we, um, we only had less... We had less than a hundred U.S. personnel on our on our base. The African National Army had less than a hundred personnel on their side. That's all it was like a small fort observation base. So we were crossing fingers hoping there's no big Taliban Taliban force coming to overrun us because they could take us. But um, no, um, the African National Army stayed on their side. We stayed on our side. We had our own little chow hall. Our chow hall was basically the size of a. Uh, I would I'd say about twice the size of your classroom. Maybe, maybe, no, no bigger. And um, food we had was Friday. Friday was a good day because at least Friday, you know, you're getting, you know, you're getting butterfly shrimp, you're getting coconut shrimp, whatever. You're getting shrimp scant pea, and uh, maybe a steak. But other days you get uh, you get processed barbecue rib meat, which we came to hate so much. Uh, you know, maybe blackened catfish, uh, a side of vegetable, whether it be peas or corn. You know, obviously you have whatever you want to drink, any, any soda you want to drink, you can have. You have, you know, ice cream bars you can have. Um, you know, the, the main dish is probably pizza, like like school lunch. Basically like school lunch, and the portions are school lunch portions, okay. you know. Um, but like I said, it was a small base. You get school lunch portions, but because the base is so small, who's gonna say anything if you want to go back and get some more? You know, especially my guys who have been doing patrols and on mission. We had we had Air Force guys serving us. The Air Force personnel was the support personnel. The Army guys like this were the infantry personnel. We were the ones out there doing, you know, being boys doing the dirty job. And these guys were inside the base, safe and sound. All they had to do was feed us and keep us happy. Sometimes they couldn't even do that right. <laughs> There were times it got to a point where we had to eat two times a week those little pastas, barbecue, little rib fingers. And uh, I, I remember one time coming in on a long day patrol, just, you know, long day patrol, and we, we got engaged many times, and I come back, and we were, my guys are starving, hungry. And what did we have to eat was that little pastas, barbecue, rib meat. And I went off on the Air Force guy. I felt bad for him. I was I was disgruntled. I was just pissed off and just went off on him. Think, you know, thinking, you know, thinking what, what? Asking myself, what did he have to eat? He probably had some good stuff. He probably sat there in his, his little office and made himself something good. Uh, my my guys, myself, could come and eat this processed stuff. It was imitation meat, soaked in barbecue sauce. Well, I, I let him have it. How about supplies? Did you have plenty of supplies? No, oh, the first uh, that that was that was an issue too. I think uh, our battalion gave us what they thought we needed. 
you know. And uh, of course, the headquarters section got the better stuff. Normal. That's normal. In any army unit, headquarters section gets the better stuff. We get, we get just stuff. We were, we were told that the unit we were leaving were supposed to sign over equipment to us. They signed over equipment, but they signed over some equipment. Because most of the equipment that they needed was from their battalion. They weren't going to sign off stuff from their battalion that they had to bring back. So they gave us the minor stuff. Uh, supplies sucked as far as supplies pertaining to stuff we needed to do our mission. Um, like gear. That kind of sucked. I mean, when we showed up, every soldier had their own night vision. Every soldier had their own weapon, had their own aiming system, had their own, uh, you know, they had their, they had their full, com their basic combat load, stuff they needed to fight. Ammunition was a problem at first. We got there and we were thinking, where are we going to get our ammo from? Luckily, the Marines we relieved, and these are your typical Marines, great, great guys, by the way, the guys I relieved, they were good, one, three, two, two three, was real good. Um, they, they, had, they had an ammo connex, and they didn't want to bring it back. They didn't want. They didn't want to bring it back because they were supposed to expend it all, or blow it up. They didn't want to bring it back, so they came up to us and go, "Hey, you guys, you guys need ammo?" And we're like, "Yeah, yeah, man, you have ammo." Like, "Yeah, come with us." So they brought us to the iconics to open it up, and it was like a city of gold, because they had everything that they didn't use. They even had an old Vietnam era law, which is a lot of stuff you see in the Chuck, the Chuck Norris movie, the Missing Action movies. The little missile launcher that you extend. <laughs> I haven't seen those since I went to basic training in uh, 1998, never seen them up close. They had those, they had, they had uh, C4 that was stacked up high. They had everything, javelins, ammunition, grenade launchers, grenades, everything, uh, trip flares. They had Claymore mines, and we're like, you guys are heaven sent. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it's all yours. Do you need to sign paperwork? Nope, take it. <laughs> so, uh, I need to say, we, were, we never had to worry about ammunition. Because um, the battalion, you know, battalion kind of dropped the ball on that, and you know, like you said, it was it was it was confusing because our our battalion got split up to individual platoons who were assigned to a PRT, and a PRT commander was usually a Navy or Air Force commander, and uh, communication got mixed up about who was going to supply the infantry, whether it be the battalion or was it going to be the PRT, and we were we were actually one of the lucky ones. Minus headquarters section, who was, you know, they had all the stuff with them. But we were one of the very few lucky ones who ran into Marines who had ammunition for us. But um, radios, radios was a nightmare. We had to use what we call the uh, embitters, embitter radios. Basically, it was just a glorified walkie talkie, glorified Motorola walkie talkie. I mean, it, 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 they, we used it because it was encrypted. If the enemy got their hands on it, they couldn't break the code. It was encrypted. We had it. Small little radio, you could hook onto yourself, but it was worthless in, in convoy operations because first of all, being in Afghanistan, you're mountains, and you don't have line of sight with the vehicle in front of you or behind you at times. A lot of times you did, and when you don't have line of sight, you have no communications. Mm -hmm. And the embedders was a line of sight, you know, radio, it was, and that's how it was for the first uh, I want to say two months was when we were out in convoy operations. You had to, we had to make sure the vehicles were close together, and that was that was dangerous. That was extremely dangerous to have vehicles so close together, because if a car, if a, if a roadside bomb goes off, that's two vehicles, you know, and um, which I, I totally I completely advise against. But we had no choice. We had to make sure we had a line of sight with the vehicles in front of us, just so we could have radio communications. So we had to we had to revert back to the old Vietnam era kind of do, doing kind of way uh, things, doing things kind of way, which was you know armored hand signals. I had, to, I had to pass message to my, I had to give a class to my gunners to how to use armored hand signals, you know. So that's, that's what we ended up doing. That's how we pass, that's how I pass information when I couldn't see, when I couldn't get radio communications, when I could see my gunner, hey, I need you to pass this up. He would get the uh, attention of the next gunner and do the armored hand signals and they would know what I'm talking about. And we had to do that. And that, was, that sucked right there. Uh, and we had the old, the old uh, electronic countermeasures, which is what we used to uh, counter their roadside bombs, because a lot of the roadside bombs were rig radio controlled. Mm. So an electro electronic countermeasure, what it does is it jammed the signal so they couldn't detonate it. They got smart later on, but um, we had the old electronic countermeasure device. 
some are Humvees, just uh, <laughs> the auto is bare minimum, which I didn't mind at times. Actually, actually, I actually, actually didn't mind at all. I, my truck that I kept for myself was actually a bare minimum armored truck, and I didn't mind at all because it was the fastest, the most agile truck. And um, that's what that's one of the issues. That was that was the, the supply issues we had. But uh, it got fixed later on. It got fixed because we were the one making the most. We were the only PRT team in uh country that's been in the mo in the most combat. That's been engaged the most. And I got that like, caught the attention of the uh, the the brigade commander, the tenth mountain commander, that the whole PRT was under. It got it got the it got the attention of him, and he realized, you know, these guys these guys are taking a hit pretty bad. Because usually wherever the PRT team is, even though there's a, even though there's an infantry platoon protecting the PRT team, there's all there's also another infantry platoon that was dedicated to kinetic missions, straight offensive missions, and a lot of these PRT teams had that with them. A lot of these PRT teams had special forces with them also. We were the only PRT team without without another American infantry platoon that was supposed to support us, that should be supporting us. We didn't have special forces guys within our vicinity. The closest the closest support we got was an hour and a half away in Jalalabad. And that's where the reg that's where the regular infantry kinetic mission guys were. That's where the special forces were. For them to get to us to take an hour and a half by vehicle. By bird, it'll take him probably a good 20 minutes by bird. But um, we didn't have that support. We didn't have the extra personnel support. And uh, we, were, we were left out there. That, that's what made us unique. That's what, that's what built us. That's what bought us. And that, that's what gave us a name. It gave our, our PRT team, our platoon, a name in the country, in the town. Because a lot of times on the satellite radio, guys in the back would hear it, and they would hear our call sign. And they would, they would say to themselves, isn't this a PRT team? What are they doing? Doing? How come they do offensive missions? How come? How come they're always engaged? Well, it's just for the reason I gave you. We didn't have enough militaries. We didn't have enough infantry support from the other units. So we were left alone, you know. And uh, like I said, I caught the attention of the battalion of the brigade commander, Spartan Six. Uh, and he, he, then he started sending us more supplies. Started, started giving us more priority over some of the other units. So we, we, we finally got the new radios. Some of our homies got the armored, armored kit came. Um, you know, we, 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 we got what we asked for. And let me tell you, having the new radios in there made a huge difference. Huge difference, because now we can hear each other. We had the radios, we had the, the boom kit on the, uh, the mic, the, the speaker speaker kit. So we were able to, or now, we, we, didn't, we didn't have to have the uh, mic up to our ears because we had the speaker kit which we could hear throughout the entire Humvee and it, I'm telling you we God it was like Christmas just getting that just the smallest thing that makes us so happy and that made me extremely happy just to be able to listen to everybody in the entire convoys you know so supplies got better that's good did you feel pressure or stress while we were doing things like this I felt a lot of pressure and stress pressure and stress from within and pressure and stress from without I mean the internal stress was you know what do I need to do? What, what's what's wrong right now? What's what's going on? Is is do I have security up? You know, is is, is everything is everything okay? Have have my have are my have my men eat? my men getting enough sleep? Or what's what's going on at home? With or are there, how come he's how come he's he's lying? How come he's not talking as much? Is does he have personal problems at home? You know, at the same time, you know, I'm having personal problems at home. And I had, I had I had to block that out because priority was the mission and priority was my soldiers. So that, that those were the internal stress was keeping the morale keeping their morale up. And the external stress was the stuff that I couldn't control. The roadside bombs, the attacks, mm -hmm. you know. All that host all that hostility from from without, all that potential threat, potential danger, those were the external stress. I mean I I grew I grew more gray hairs. The whole time that I ever did my entire life, so far, I, I I dye my hair now at least once every three weeks. Literally, I I dye my hair. <laughs> did you have anything special that you used as a good luck omen? I did. Good luck. I did. I had Thor's hammer. Um, where where I worked my civilian job, I had this nice family who comes in, and they, they had two great kids, Nick and Claire. 
they was probably about six years old at the time, and Nick was about eight. Uh, and you know, they, 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 they got close because they, they, they got close to me because they come in and I talk to them. Like I said, small grocery store, you get real person, you get real personable with your your um, customers. And uh, yeah, and they knew I was going to go to Afghanistan. So Claire came in one day and she brought me a gift. And she brought me Thor's hammer that I wore around my dog, dog tags. Small little hammer. I think I have to have it now. I even, even know it's a good stay. It was, it was the first time that the Logman governor drove up there. So it was a big deal. We got up there, there was a whole party waiting for us. Well, a whole welcoming party, not, not in a bad way, but they had the Afghan National Army and Afghan National Police who have great distrust of each other, had to work with each other and secure the spot before we showed up. It was about an hour and a half drive, two hour drive. And it's only one road, a long mountain path. And uh, on our way back, I don't know what was going on. It was a long, huge, huge convoy made up of A and A, A and P, and military. Long convoy, and uh, NDS, which is the national, national, uh, whatever. It's the it's the Afghan's equivalent of the FBI, mm -hmm. the, the National Directorate Service, or something like that. I forgot what it, what it stood for, but it was a long convoy. And um, ironically, well, I was I was at the end of the convoy. I was near the end. I was the last military vehicle, and behind me was an AMP vehicle, the Afghan National Police vehicle, and behind him was a, a, a Afghan National Army truck. And in front of me was a, a national, an Afghan National Army truck, and then in front of that national Afghan National Army truck was the embedded training team, which is another military force who, who was embedded with the Afghan National Army to train them and take them take them out on missions. And uh, ironically, we ended up. I ended up in an area where I took the motor with my where my first patrol back no, my first patrol back took motor around. And um but they like I said, I was at the end of the convoy, it was a long convoy. The front of the convoy started taking motor rounds. But we were already we were already behind. We we, we could see we could see the, the hill getting hit because we were going up the hill and the beginning of the convoy starts taking motor rounds. Inaccurate, but a lot. Mm. And uh, I'm telling my gunner, I said, Hey do you see him, do you see him? And my guys are looking and looking, no, we can't see where it's coming from. And we're getting closer. Motor rounds still come in, we're getting closer in. Luckily, the guy behind me was an Air Force mechanic. I took him along with me because he hasn't been outside the wire and he wanted to go so bad. So I took him with me and he sat behind me, I kept him behind me. And he was the only guy to see where it came from. He could see the streamers. When the motor rounds are sent out, you know, old, old mortar tubes, you can see the streamers, the smoke tubes. And he sees it. My gunner still hasn't seen it. And um, nobody sees it. And I think the last order on on the mic from the platoon sergeant was stay inside your vehicle. My guy doesn't see it. But I see it, and uh, you know I had one. I had a, I had a full mag. I had one magazine that was all tracers, thirty rounds of tracers. And tracers are ammunition that lights up when you shoot it because the tip it has a phosphorus tip, so it lights up like lasers when you shoot it. And um, and so I roll. I rolled. I rolled the windows down. Roll the windows down, and I shot my entire tracers until my gunner could see where it, see it, where it was. And right when I shot the tracers, the, of, course, of course the enemy saw where it came from also. Then we realized there was another mortar precision. So there was two mortar precisions. That's why they were able to fire it so fast, which is also why it was also not too accurate. But it was close. So we saw two mortar precisions, and uh, my gunner engaged. And uh, then for some, for some reason, the convoy decides to stop. But it... It chose. It couldn't choose a better time to stop, because when they stopped, it left my truck, my the the three A and A A and P truck on the mountaintop, where they where they where they were the country and fired on. And I'm thinking, wow, this is unbelievable. I was I was cussing every word that was out of the American dictionary, out of the Webster dictionary, and using every bad word out of the dictionary. I'm getting on the radio like you know, screaming, yeah, what? What, what's going on? We, um, we're, we're exposed up in the mountains. They're, of course, they were safe because they were already down, and they were already down in the in the uh, sort of I want to say populated area in a village area where there was trees, and a nice little river, and they were safe. But I wasn't, and I'm still taking water rounds. And uh, I look at the guys in the A and A truck in front of me, and they're they're looking at me like, "What do we do? What do we do? We can get hit in a moment." And my guys, my guys, are like, "Sorry, no. We, we, we need to tell these guys to start moving." And uh, I'm getting on the radio. I'm like, you know. What the hell's going on? You need to move now. And uh, we weren't moving, and the motor was still coming in. And I just got to a point where, you know what? We're going to die anyways. 
so F it. So I kicked the door open, and I was the first one out of the vehicle. I kicked the door open, and my guys decided to follow me. The only one who stayed in the truck was uh, the gunner. My guys got out of the vehicle, and uh, so we were exposed. You know, it was, it was mano y mano. They could see us, we can see them. We were exposed. Uh, we started returning fire. I was like, screw it, everyone, expend all your ammo, right? Expend your ammo right now. I want you to light, light them up. So we were engaging in two mortar positions. And the mortar rounds were just coming in left and right, left and right. So the A&A sees it, and you know, they're like, wow, these, these, guys are, these guys are no joke. So they get out of their trucks. The other guys get out of their truck. Their truck and now we got a whole firing line set up. You know, we got probably about, I would want to say, a good 20 guys, 20, 25 guys in the firing line. And it was just spraying away. And it was mortar rounds coming in, machine gun fire coming at us, and we were just spraying away. My trucks, my, my gunner on the trucks was shooting away. Uh, we were able to silence one, one more decision. We, we got one more decision. And um, the guys who were safe in the in the nice little wooded area now sees see they they could they could see the tracer run going at it. They could see what we were shooting at, so they started returning fire. So now we have maximum firepower on both positions. And um, one mortar round landed probably about I want to say thirty yards behind me on the other side of the truck. And that's when my medic looks at me and goes, "Start roll." And uh, they get they can get kind of close. And I'm like, "Doc, just keep an effing shooting. Keep an effing shooting." Because we're not moving anytime soon. And um, the thing they got, and about 30 seconds later, a mortar round lands about 15 yards to my right, right behind the Afghan National Police truck. And I can see guys flying. And uh, then my medic looks at me, he goes, Sergeant Rowan, I think we need to get inside the vehicle. And I just looked at him. And like, <laughs> it, was, it, was, it was a funny moment because I looked at him, and my guys my guys still assume, and they're looking at me, and I'm like, Yeah, I think you're right. Let's go. It's just, just like that. I think you're right. No screaming, no yelling. Just, I think you're right. Let's go. <laughs> and uh, I get in the vehicle, and I, I uh, called it up. You know, I, I called it up, and I said, hey, Raider 7, we just took a motor on in our, in our convoy. Uh, I think the AP truck is hit. And uh, they go, okay, we're moving. Sure enough, we start moving. Uh, we took one final motor round, and that motor round landed probably about five meters away from the road, where, right where my truck was. My gunner saw me like, so I don't want we got out of there. Because <laughs> that motor on just landed right where we were. And, uh, you know, the guys, the guys, the guys in the truck behind me weren't hurt. What happened was the motor on hit, but it hit so close that the guys decided to jump after the motor on hit. I don't, I don't know why. The yeah, guys were funny like that. But decided to jump, and that's what I saw when I said bodies were flying. It was a couple of Afghan guys were jumping on the way. And um, that was a memorable moment, because I thought it was, it was funny. It was, it was funny. It was just a adrenaline rush at the same time because it was just, you know, it's. It, it was like it was. It kind of reminded me of the old Revolutionary War days where it was, firing line and firing line. That's what it was. It was firing line and firing line, and just how it ended was was funny. Came out of it. Did you uh, get any awards or medals or citations while you were in service? Um, I think the biggest award I got was the Army Commendation Medal, the ARCOM, and. Uh, of course, everyone, everyone in my platoon got the combat infantryman badge, which means you've been in combat. Uh, a couple other squad leaders got the Army Commendation with Valor, and uh, like that kind of left a bad taste in my mouth. I mean, it was it, it, it was it was an internal political conflict in the platoon. You know, platoon sergeant and platoon leader didn't really like me too much, and. It was, I, I, was, I, was, I was bitter about it, but I was more bitter because my men deserved more. My men deserved more than what they got. That's, that's what I was, I was bitter about. I mean, minus the fact that the other staff sergeants got the ARCOM, the ARCOM with Valor. And, you know, my, the my whole entire squad was just saying to ourselves, how could, how could they get the ARCOM with Valor and their guys get the bigger awards when we've been in more firefights and we're the ones who saved their ass a lot of times? Because sadly, that, sadly that, was, that was the truth was that most of the time we we were tasked with being the quick reaction force, and when these squads got hit, it was my squad who went out there and uh, pulled them back, got them back safely, or reinforced them. So that, that kind of left a, a bitter taste in in our mouths. Was you know these squad leaders got that higher higher award, but it you know it, it was it was more I was I was more bitter for my men than it was for myself. I didn't I didn't care. Awards mean absolutely nothing to me. Absolutely nothing. I'd rather have guys coming back home safe in one piece than have a ward. I mean, if as as as, as long as as long as guys come home and they come home safe, we're fine. 
you can keep your award. I'll, 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 I'll trade any award for, for an American life. For the American soldiers' lives, Marines or airmen or seamen. Let's move forward a little bit towards uh, what you did and how you stayed in touch and, and your daily life there. What? Um, how did you, did you stay in touch with your family? I did. We had a our small little fob had a little uh, M MWR center, it was Morale Welfare and Recreation Center, and we had uh, computers and DSN phones set up. As long as you have a as long as you have a calling card. Not a civilian calling card, but the kind of MWR gives you. And um, we were able to get online whenever you have free time, get online, get online, send emails, or make a phone call. Um, I, I, was, I, was, I was able to call home a lot and keep in touch a lot. You know, I mean, especially after, 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 after once we had the second month, we, we had our, you know, we, we had a set schedule. Every, you know, we had three squads, each squad knew what they were doing. One, for one week, a squad would be on missions. One squad would be on quick. One squad would be the quick reaction force, and one squad would be on guard duty. And you rotate, rotate. So which squad, whatever squad was on, which whichever squad was doing the quick reaction force, or on guard duty, they had more time than the squad who were on missions to use the phone and uh, go on the internet. But it was um, mail. Mail sucked for the first few months. You know, you get mail like once every three weeks. But guys should be able to call home or send emails home. So that was not a problem. Um, you mentioned uh, that you, the big base had big mess halls. What type of food did you have? The big one or our, our, our smaller ones? You are a smaller one. <laughs> smaller for, for the observation base? Prison food. <laughs> we had prison food. No, no, but uh, God, we, um, we only had less, we had less than 100 U.S. personnel on our, on our base. The African National Army had less than 100 personnel on their side. That's all it was at a small fort observation base. So we were crossing the fingers hoping there's no big Taliban, Taliban force coming to overrun us because they could take us. But um, no, um, the African National Army stayed on their side. We stayed on our side. We had our own little trial hall. Our trial hall was basically the size of a, uh, I would I'd say about twice the size of your classroom. Maybe, maybe. No, no bigger. And the um, food we had was Friday. Friday was a good day because at least Friday, you know, you're getting, you know, you're getting butterfly shrimp, you're getting coconut shrimp, whatever. You're getting shrimp scant pea, and uh, maybe a steak. But other days, you get uh, you get processed barbecue rib meat, which we came to hate so much. Uh, you know, maybe blackened catfish. Uh, side of vegetable, whether it be peas or corn, you know, obviously you have whatever you want to drink, any, any soda you want to drink, you can have. You have, you know, ice cream bars you can have. Um, you know, the, the main dish is probably pizza, like like school lunch. Basically like school lunch, and the portions are school lunch portions, okay. you know. Um, but it, like I said, it was a small base, you get school lunch portions, but because the base is so small, Who's gonna say anything if you want to go back and get some more? You know, especially my guys who have been doing patrols and on mission. We had we had Air Force guys serving us. The Air Force personnel was the support personnel. The Army guys like this were the infantry personnel. We were the ones out there doing, you know, beating boys doing the dirty job. And these guys were inside the base, safe and sound. All they had to do was feed us and keep us happy. Sometimes they couldn't even do that right. Because <laughs> there were times it got to a point where we had to eat two times a week. Those little Process, barbecue, little rib fingers, and uh, I, I remember one time coming in from a long day patrol, just you know, long day patrol, and we, we got engaged many times, and I come back, and we were, my guys are starving, hungry, and what do we have to eat was that little process barbecue with me, and I went off on the Air Force guy. <laughs> I felt bad for him. I was I was disgruntled. I was just pissed off, and just went off on him. Think, you know, thinking, you know, thinking what, what, asking myself, what did he have to eat? He probably had some good stuff. He probably sat there in his, his little office and made himself something good. Uh, my, my guys, myself, could come and eat this processed stuff. It was imitation meat, soaked in barbecue sauce. Well, I, I let him have it. How about supplies? Did you have plenty of supplies? 
No, the first uh, that was, that was that was an issue too. I think uh, our battalion gave us what they thought we needed, you know. And uh, of course, the headquarters section got the better stuff. Normal, that's normal. In any army unit, headquarters section gets the better stuff. We get we get just stuff. We were we were told that the unit we were leaving we were supposed to sign over equipment to us. They signed over equipment, but they signed over some equipment because. Most of the equipment that they needed was from their battalion. They weren't going to sign off stuff from their battalion that they had to bring back. So they gave us some minor stuff. Uh, supplies sucked as far as supplies pertaining to stuff we needed to do our mission, um, like gear. That kind of sucked. I mean, when we showed up, every soldier had their own night vision. Every soldier had their own weapon, had their own aiming system, had their own, uh, you know, they had their they had their full com their basic combat load, stuff they needed to fight. Ammunition was a problem at first. We got there, we were thinking, where are we gonna get our ammo from? Luckily, the Marines we relieved, and these are your typical Marines, great great guys by the way, the guys I relieved, they were good. One three two two three guys were really good. Um, they they had they had an ammo connex, and they didn't want to bring it back. They didn't want they didn't want to bring it back because it was just to expend it all, or blow it up. They didn't want to bring it back, so they came up to us and go, hey. You guys, you guys need ammo? We're like, yeah, yeah, man, you got ammo? Like, yeah, come with us. So they brought us to the iconics to open it up, and it was like a city of gold. Because they had everything that they didn't use. They even had an old Vietnam era law, which is a lot of stuff you've seen in Chuck, the Chuck Norris movie, the missing action movies, the little missile launcher that you extend. <laughs> I haven't seen those since I went to basic training in uh, 1998. Never seen them up close. They had those, they had, they had, uh, C4 that was stacked up high. They had everything, javelins, ammunition, grenade launchers, grenades, everything, uh, trip flares. They had Claymore mines, and we're like, you guys are heaven sent. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, it's all yours. Do you need to sign paperwork? Nope, take it. <laughs> so, uh, you say, we, were, we never had to worry about ammunition. Because um, battalion, you know, battalion kind of dropped the ball on that, and you know, like you said, it was it was it was confusing because our our battalion got split up to individual platoons who were assigned to a PRT, and a PRT commander was usually a neighbor Air Force commander, and uh, communication got mixed up about who was going to supply the infantry, whether it be the battalion or was it going to be the PRT, and we were we were actually one of the lucky ones, minus headquarters section who was you know they had all the stuff with them, but we were one of the very few lucky ones who. Ran into Marines who had ammunition for us, but um, radios, radios was a nightmare. We had to use what we call the uh, embitters, embitter radios. Basically, it was just a glorified walkie-talkie, glorified Motorola walkie-talkie. I mean, it, 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 they, we used it because it was encrypted. If the enemy got their hands on it, they couldn't break the code. It was encrypted. We had it. Small little radio, you could hook onto yourself, but it was worthless in, in convoy operations because first of all being in Afghanistan you're mountains and you don't have line of sight with the vehicle in front of you or behind you at times a lot of times you did and when you don't have line of sight you have no communications and the embedders were the line of sight you know radio it was, and that's how it was for the first uh, I want to say two months was when we were out in convoy operations you had to, you had to make sure the vehicles were close together and that was that was dangerous. That was extremely dangerous to have vehicles so close together. Because if a car, if a, if a roadside bomb goes off, that's two vehicles, you know. And um, which I, I totally, I completely advise against. But we had no choice. We had to make sure we had a line of sight with the vehicles in front of us, just so we could have radio communications. So we had to, we had to revert back to the old Vietnam era, kind of do, doing kind of way, uh, things, doing things kind of way, which was you know, our armored hand signals. I had to, I had to pass message to my, I had to give a class to my gunners to how to use armored hand signals, you know. So that's, that's what we end up doing. That's how we pass, that's how I pass information when I couldn't see, when I couldn't get radio communications, when I was telling my gunner, hey, I need you to pass this up. You would get the uh, attention of the next gunner and do the armored hand signals and they would know what I'm talking about. And we had to do that. And that, was, that sucked right there. Uh, and we had the old, the old, uh, Electronic countermeasures, which is what we use to uh, counter their 
roadside bombs. Because a lot of the roadside bombs were radio, radio controlled. Mm. So an electronic, electronic countermeasure, what it does is it jammed the signal, so they couldn't detonate it. They got smart later on, but um, we had the old electronic countermeasure device. Some of our Humvees, just uh, <laughs> the armor was bare minimum, which I didn't mind at times. Actually, I actually, I, I actually didn't mind at all. I, my truck that I kept for myself was actually a bare minimum armored truck. And I didn't mind at all because it was the fastest and most agile truck. And um, that's one that's of the issues. That was, that was the, the supply issues we had. But uh, it got fixed later on. It got fixed because we were the one making the most, we were the only PRT team in the uh, country that's been in the, mo in the most combat, that's been engaged the most. And I got, that got caught the attention of the, uh, the, the brigade commander, the 10th Mountain commander that the whole PRT was under. It got, it, got the, it got the attention of him and he realized, you know, these guys, these guys are taking a hit pretty bad. Because usually wherever the PRT team is, even though there's, a, even though there's an infantry platoon protecting the PRT team, there's, all, there's also another infantry platoon that was dedicated to kinetic missions, straight offensive missions. And a lot of these PRT teams had that with them. A lot of these PRT teams had special forces with them also. We were the only PRT team without, without another American infantry platoon that was supposed to support us, that should be supporting us. We didn't have special forces guys within our vicinity. But the closest, the closest support we got was an hour and a half away in Jalalabad, and that's where the reg, that's where the regular infantry kinetic mission guys were. That's where the special forces were. For them to get to us, it take an hour and a half by vehicle, by bird. It'll take them probably a good twenty minutes by bird. But um, we didn't have that support. We didn't have the extra personnel support, and uh, we were we were left out there. That, that's what made us unique. That's what that's what built us. That's what bonded us. That that's what gave us a name. It gave our our PRT team, our platoon, a name in the country in the battalion. Because a lot of times on the satellite radio, guys in the back would hear it and they would hear our call sign, and they would say, they would say to themselves, "Isn't this a PRT team? What are they doing? Doing? How come they do offensive missions? How come how come they're always engaged?" Well, just for the reason I gave you. We didn't have enough military, we didn't have enough infantry support from the other units. So we were left alone, you know. And uh, like I said, it caught the attention of the battalion, of the brigade commander, Spartan 6. Uh, and he, he, then he started sending us more supplies. He started, started giving us more priority over some of the other units. So we, we, we finally got to do radios. Some of our homies got the armor armor kit came. Um, you know, we, 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 we got what we asked for. And let me tell you, having the new radios in there made a huge difference. Huge difference. Because now we can hear each other. We had the radios, we had the the boom kit on the uh, the mic, the the speaker, speaker kit. So we were able to or now we, we didn't we didn't have to have the uh, mic up to our ears because we had to speaker kit which we could hear throughout the entire Humvee and it, I'm telling you we God it was like Christmas just getting that just the smallest thing makes us so happy and that made me extremely happy just to be able to listen to everybody in the entire convoys you know so supplies got better that's good did you feel pressure or stress while you were doing things like this I felt a lot of pressure and stress pressure and stress from within and pressure and stress from without I mean the internal stress was you know what do I need to do what What's what's wrong right now? What's what's going on? Is is do I have security up? You know, is is, is everything is everything okay? Have have my have on my have my men eat? my men get enough sleep? You know, what's what's going on at home? With or are, are there how come he's how come he's he's lagging? How come he's not talking as much? Is does he have personal problems at home? You know, at the same time, you know, I'm having personal problems at home, and I had I had, I had to block that out because priority was the mission and priority was my soldiers. So that, that was really internal stress, was keeping the morale, keeping the morale up. And the external stress was the stuff that I couldn't control, the roadside bombs, the attacks, mm -hmm. you know. All that, host, all that hostility from, from without, all that potential threat, potential danger, those were the external stress. I mean, I, I, grew, I grew more gray hairs my whole time than I ever did my entire life so far. I, I dye my hair now, at least once every three weeks. Literally, I, I dye my hair. <laughs> did you have anything special that you used as a good luck omen? I did. Good luck. I did. 
I had Thor's hammer. Um, well, where I worked my civilian job, I had this nice family who comes in, and they, they had two great kids, Nick and Claire. Claire was probably about six years old at the time, and Nick was about eight. Uh, and you know, they, 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 they got close because they, they, they got close to me because they come in and I talk to them. Like I said, small grocery store, you get real person, you get real personable with your your um, customers, and uh, yeah, and they knew I was going to go to Afghanistan. So Claire came in one day and she brought me a gift and she brought me Thor's hammer that I wore around my dog felt tags. Small little hammer. I think I have to hand now. I even, even have it to this day. Oh, it's about the keychain. I have two keychains, but it's about the keychain. Um, Small Lord Hammer. Thor, as you know, is the god, the Celtic god of thunder. And uh, I, I kept that and I wore it. And uh, I don't know if it's, I don't know if it was that or just God's intervention, divine intervention, but there, I, there's some close calls where I should have been dead. And I, I did. Instead, other people around me get hit. Uh, I had, a, I had a, t a, a team leader who stood probably about a foot away from me during, during one of the engagements. And a, a grenade went off. He stood literally a foot away from me. And uh, a grenade went off about 20 feet to my left. 15 to 20 feet to my left. And like I said, I'm standing between him and the grenade. And, um, and I wasn't standing, I'm sorry, I was kneeling. Kneeling between him and the grenade. So I was dipping my hand into the stream, getting some water. The grenade goes off. I miraculously didn't get hit. He, on the other hand, got hit. And he took a strap and wound to his knee that permanently damaged his nerve. And he, he's walking with a limb. He's walking with a limb for the rest of his life. But um, it hit him. And uh, I think the first words that came out of his mouth was, shit, they got me, sorry. Typical words that came out of his mouth, they got me, sorry. And I'm looking at him, I'm like, I'm looking at him, he seems okay, but then he starts to go down. And I'm, I'm checking myself. And guys are running over, and I'm, I'm checking, you know, the guys are just yelling on the radio, and guys are running over. And we got we to gotta take, we, gotta, we, gotta, we, we were taking, we were taking combat, and they want to know what's going on. And I'm checking myself like, I, I didn't, how, how, did I, how did I not get hit? And he gets hit. You know, I'm, standing, I'm standing between him and where the grenade went off, and I didn't get hit. And then I look at him, and he's, now he's starting to scream and yell. And he's not crying, but he's screaming and yelling. And uh, I, don't, I, don't, I still don't see anything yet, but he's holding his knee. And I don't, I don't see a puncture, and then I start to see blood. And he's like, Sarge, Sarge, I, th I think I'm hit, I'm, 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 I'm hit, Sarge. And uh, he, reaches his, he reaches his hands out to me, and the medic comes running over. He reaches his hands out to me, and uh, for some reason, <laughs> I just look at him, and I smack the hand, I just smack it away, and I just told him, you know, you need to shut the fuck up. You're gonna, you're gonna give us away, you know? Just hope you're, 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 you're gonna be all right. <laughs> you know, because he, 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 he acted as if he was gonna die. And I'm looking at him like, stop being a little, you know, Stop being a little wimp. Suck it up. You know, you still got your legs. Suck it up. Uh, which I felt bad afterward because he had. I find that found out that he had per permanent nerve damage. But the first reaction to me was I smacked his hand away. And my guy still talk about it to this day. My squad still talks about it because it was like it was like a classic movie scene. So much I got hit. And instead of taking his hand and holding it and comforting him, I just smack it away. He needs to say my other team leader runs over and holds his hand for him and comforts him. But I'm just looking. I'm like stop being a little. We're like it's 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 month four into our our mission. Let's suck it up.